Dear listeners, we would love to get to know you better. Please write in the comments which country and city you are watching us from. Thank you. I was down in the basement working on finishing the recreation room I promised my 15-year-old daughter, Janet. I had already completed the ceiling and walls and closed in a section under the stairs for extra storage. Now I was laying down the indoor-outdoor carpet I'd brought home last night. I had all the time I needed to work on it since my wife, Jamie, was in Cleveland visiting her mother. I had the entire house to myself today. As Janet was sleeping over at one of her high school friend's houses, I'd spoken with her friend's mother, who assured me that she and her husband would be home at all times. They were good people and friends, so I felt it was okay. I thought back to Sunday night, the evening before Jamie left. She had been angry with me, as usual, and wouldn't talk much about her visit. She simply said she needed some time to herself and would be gone for two weeks. Jamie hadn't been working since she was let go during a cutback at the bank about two years ago. Since I earned a good income, there was no need for her to work, and she decided to stay home for a while. I'd hoped the time off would help her relax and maybe help us repair some of the growing gaps in our marriage. So far, though, it hadn't been of much help. My name is Jim Schwan. I'm 50 years old and a partner at Harris, Schwan, and Wilson Attorneys. Joe Harris and I founded the practice here in Street Lewis almost 20 years ago, and Margaret Wilson joined us five years later. We specialize in corporate law, and the practice has been very successful. I hadn't been in court much in recent years since we had a core of talented young lawyers eager to prove their worth. They all wanted to become partners, but since we had only added one or two partners in the past 17 years, they fought all the harder for opportunities. I mentored them, guiding them through the pitfalls of corporate law, then let them prove themselves. Margaret handled the client-facing side, managing the lawyers like a real powerhouse. Everyone seemed happy with their time at our firm. It was definitely a great experience to put on their resumes. Jamie and I married 19 years ago. It was a second marriage for both of us. And we had a daughter together, Janet. My first wife had passed away in a car accident, and we had no children together. Jamie had a son from her first marriage who is now 24 and lives with his father. He's married with kids of his own now, and Jamie sometimes talks to him on the phone, though... To my knowledge, she's never visited him. She rarely talks about him. So I eventually let it drop. We had Janet 16 years ago, and she was our last, as Jamie had complications during her delivery that required a hysterectomy. This marked the end of her childbearing years, but we were both okay with that. We did go through the process of retrieving and saving some of Jamie's biological material before her procedure but we eventually let it expire without taking further action. Janet was enough for both of us. And at the time, we didn't feel the need for more children. Besides, our marriage was going through a rough patch, making it difficult to make such decisions. Jamie's parents had lived in Cleveland, and we used to visit them twice a year as a family. Occasionally, Jamie would go on her own or take Janet, though it had been over a year since either Janet or I had been there. If my memory served me correctly, Jamie had gone to see her parents shortly after she was let go from her job. Rather than things improving as I had hoped, her mood seemed to worsen. When Jamie eventually said she wanted to spend some time with her mother, I thought a little distance might be good for both of us, so I readily agreed. I missed her after just a few days, but she must not have felt the same way. She stayed a full ten days, extending her visit from one week to stay over an additional weekend. With my parents deceased and being an only child, Jamie's parents, Jan and Ruth, were the closest thing I had to family. However, my relationship with her mother was challenging, as she and I had never really connected. Jamie, too, was more attached to her mother than her father, which sometimes caused tension. I liked her dad and he and I became friends, keeping in touch over the phone or by email. But that had gradually declined over the past two years. I assumed that her mother's attitude toward me was partly responsible, affecting my friendship with her father as well. Still, I never resented Jamie's visits with her parents. This time, though, it wasn't an ordinary visit. 
It followed a period of almost a year of very strained relations between Jamie and me, which had worsened after her last trip home. Since she returned, she had been increasingly distant and critical. It seemed that almost every day there was something she wanted me to do, tasks and demands along with harsh words if I didn't act immediately. It was hard to believe, but things became even more difficult following her last trip. With Janet, however, Jamie's behavior remained consistent. Janet didn't see her mother's outbursts directed at me, so I decided not to intervene or react trying to keep the peace. Over time, it became almost a habit to simply listen quietly to Jamie's criticism and walk away. She had grown used to doing what she wanted, when she wanted, and I allowed it to avoid conflict. I even let it go on in front of Janet, or when we were with friends. I knew people thought I was being passive, but it was my decision. Perhaps it was a mistake, but it was too late to worry about that now. Jamie's approach to this trip was typical. After several days of hinting, she made the decision to go, and simply informed me she would spend two weeks with her parents. No discussion, no questions about my own plans or any challenges her absence might bring. She dismissed my request for an explanation and left me with a list of things I needed to know about Janet's activities, but nothing more. The night before she left, she packed her bags and went to bed early. In the morning, she called a cab to the airport, making it clear my help wasn't needed. She left without even saying goodbye. As for our intimacy, it had dwindled to nothing. We hadn't shared that closeness in at least two years, certainly not since she lost her job, which was 18 months ago. I know it had been at least six months since we had any intimacy before Jamie made her last trip home and even longer since I had tried to discuss it. When I attempted to initiate anything, she would get up and go into the spare room, leaving me feeling frustrated and angry. The more I pushed for communication, the more she resisted. Eventually, I decided to give up. One night, I mentioned some options to Jamie, hoping to talk things through. But instead, I received a heated response about what she would do if she suspected I was unfaithful. When I brought up the possibility of divorce due to emotional neglect, she laughed and pointed out the potential damage to my public image if it were revealed in court that she had shut me out of the bedroom. This reaction prompted an emotional outburst from me. I asked why she would stay with me if she clearly disliked me, wanted nothing to do with me, and preferred to be alone as much as possible. To my surprise, Janie burst into tears and cried for what felt like an eternity. When she finally calmed down, she told me that she loved me, always had, and always would. She explained that she was under so much stress and confusion that she didn't understand why she reacted the way she did. She begged for my patience and promised to seek help. Her pleas were so heartfelt and sincere that I was taken aback, remaining seated on the edge of the bed as she took her clothes and moved to the spare room. I was still feeling confused the next morning when she reverted to her usual critical behavior. This brings us to today. Jamie had been gone for a day and a half, and I had been reflecting on our relationship for some time. I began to believe that the only option left was to file for divorce. Janet was old enough to handle it, and would probably be happy, especially since she often expressed her disdain for how her mother treated me. I had tried to hold out for Janet's sake but perhaps now I had no other choice. I felt young enough to believe I still had a life to live, and I needed more than Jamie was willing to give. The only way to find that was to let her go. The problem was that I still loved her. Despite her behavior and how she treated me, I believed that a divorce would hurt me more than it would her. These thoughts occupied my mind as I carried some boxes down from our bedroom to the newly finished storage space under the stairs. Jamie had insisted that I clear out our closet when I made room downstairs, and I was pleased to find so much free space. Now seemed like a good time to move things. This way, I could do the work without her nagging. I was almost at the bottom of the steps on my third trip when my foot slipped, and I dropped the two boxes I was carrying. I watched them tumble as I grabbed the railing to avoid falling. They hit the floor, splitting open, 
and spilling their contents all over the new carpet. Fortunately, there were no liquids or powders in the boxes, so it seemed fine. I went down, got two empty boxes, and began reboxing the items. That's when I discovered a packet that seemed to be letters held together with a blue ribbon. I had never seen them before, which piqued my curiosity. I set them aside, assuming they were love letters from one of Janet's boyfriends. After putting the remaining items in the boxes, I pushed them toward the storage area under the stairs. I made two more trips before all the designated boxes were stored away. I closed the panel doors and collapsed on the floor, leaning against one of the walls with my feet stretched out in front of me, trying to catch my breath. As my breathing returned to normal, I noticed the stack of letters and pulled them closer. I untied the ribbon and pulled out the first letter. It was addressed to my darling Jamie. Immediately, I felt a mix of interest and anger. Jamie had never written anything like this to me at any point in our marriage, or even before. My breathing, which had calmed down, started to quicken again. Not from fatigue, but from anxiety. I unfolded the letter and noted that it had been read many times. The creases were deep, and it was almost in tatters. Clearly, this letter was cherished by Jamie. I carefully held it and began to read the words it contained. My darling Jamie, I have been thinking of the last night we spent together. I can't get you out of my mind. You drove me crazy. That was almost more than I could bear. And when you stopped, I wanted to cry. The way you made love to me was blissful. I know I won't stop thinking of you as you leave me to go back to your loveless marriage. Why won't you leave him and come to me for all time? You know my story, I'm also in a loveless marriage, and I would divorce my wife in an instant if you would say you would come to me. Please, my Jamie, reconsider, tell me you are coming back to me. With all my love, Walter. The shock I felt was so intense that I think I sat there for almost an hour before regaining my senses. I looked again at the letter and scanned the words, but they remained the same. My wife had been unfaithful to me with someone named Walter Matthews, according to the return address. I quickly checked the letter for a date and found it was written three days after Jamie returned from her visit to her mother a year ago. I grabbed the stack and pulled out another letter. This one described a different encounter, mentioning an intimate moment in the front seat of his car in the parking lot of a club. She had gone down on him at his request, and he had clearly enjoyed it. I couldn't help but think how much I would have appreciated such moments, but she had always been dismissive of them with me. I wondered if she had felt the same way about this experience. As I scanned through the rest, they all seemed to come from that same trip. It appeared she had met him midway through her visit and decided to extend her stay to spend the last weekend with him. Apparently, Walter had tried to convince her to leave me but I knew her well enough to understand she wouldn't want to deal with the complications of starting over on her own. Knowing her, she probably insisted that he divorce his wife first before she would consider doing the same. I was left questioning whether she had any genuine feelings for him beyond mere attraction, the very desire she had denied me. I let the last of the letters slip from my fingers as the reality of her betrayal settled heavily on my consciousness. Sitting in the basement, I reflected on everything she had done. It was clear from the letters, and the fact that she had kept them, that the infidelity had occurred during her trip to visit her mother, as evidenced by the dates on the letters. I wondered how she had managed to keep these letters hidden from me. Going back through the stack, I found a larger envelope with her mother's return address. This meant her mother was aware of what she had done and who she had done it with. I felt no surprise at that revelation. It was all beginning to make sense. I carried the stack of letters upstairs and placed them on the table, my mind racing as I contemplated my next steps. I now knew that my marriage was over and I would no longer be the target of her anger and demands. Up until now, I had been holding out hope that she would remember the love we once had, but it was clear she didn't. Her behavior reflected her contempt for me and a lack of concern for my well-being. She was in love with someone else, but was too afraid to leave me for him. Plus, considering he was also married, I wondered if she believed he would actually leave his wife. 
I considered several alternatives but kept returning to the fact that I could no longer stay with Jamie, especially now that I knew she didn't love me. I had no desire to endure any more of her contempt. I knew I should wait and talk to her, but I lacked the patience for that. This was the end, and it had to stop now. I resolved that by the next day, I would enlist the help of a private investigator to uncover what I needed to know. Until then, I would begin planning a life without Jamie. Before I did that, I had a couple of things to handle. The first was to securely store all of the letters from Walter. Those letters were a clear admission of infidelity, and as a lawyer, I knew how to use them. Jamie would eventually notice their absence, but until then, I had no reason to let her know how much I understood. I also wanted to protect my impressionable daughter from seeing them. I was concerned she might get the wrong idea and emulate her mother's choices. Once I ensured the letters were safely stored away, I began to formulate my options. Three days later, on a Thursday, Jamie called me. It was the only call I had received from her over the past week while she was away, and it was simply to ask me to send her a couple of things from the desk. I asked why she didn't just wait until she was home, but she responded with one of her sarcastic remarks about my lack of concern for her. I reluctantly agreed, still waiting for my investigator's report before saying anything. I had contacted him the day after I discovered the letters, and he had been gathering information for a few days already, but I hadn't heard back from him yet. During our call, Jamie didn't say much. She asked once about how Janet was doing, and then hung up without any words of affection. Just like her. That was the last call of that week, and into the next week. I expected nothing less from her. At my request, the investigator had flown to Cleveland to look into DMV records, city tax records, and anything else pertinent to identify Walter. When I entered my office that Friday before confronting her, he was waiting for me. I told my secretary not to disturb us and close my door. He opened a file and began to fill me in. Okay, Mr. Schwann, I think I've got what you need. His name's Walter Matthews and he's 45 years old, married to Mary Matthews. He has five kids. Can you believe it? The oldest is 21, and the others are between 18 and 12. There are twins in that mix. He and your wife spent the weekend in a motel just off the interstate, staying there most of the day and all night. He owns a car dealership and spends most of his time there during the day. Seems to be doing pretty well for himself, he has a nice home in the suburbs, probably worth half a million or more. Even the older kid is in grad school, and the rest are living at home with their mother, who doesn't work, and takes care of the house. He shoved a picture toward me, showing a tall man with dark hair, well-dressed and fairly good-looking, more on the thin side than bulky. I stared at it for a few seconds before pushing it back. What else did you find? No debts to speak of. Just the mortgage on the house at over $200 grand. Business records show regular tax payments and reports of business income. He pulls down about $200 grand a year before taxes. Not too shabby. The rest is routine stuff. His address, phone number, names, and ages of his kids and his wife. I have copies of his tax returns for the past three years and some comments about him from his neighbors. He seems to be well-liked and not a troublemaker. Oh, and one other thing you might find interesting. He's been visiting a local establishment regularly. I have receipts from his last five visits, showing he goes at least once a week, sometimes more. The owner says he's a steady customer and causes no trouble at all. He prefers younger companions, but they're all legal, so no help there. One thing occurred to me. Did he visit last week or this week? That was when Janie was there. Like clockwork on Tuesday afternoon. Like I told you before, he spent the weekend with your wife at a local hotel. The rest of the time, he was home with his wife. He only went out one night during the week, and that was Wednesday when he met your wife at a restaurant. They sat together, looking very affectionate. Lots of touching and such. Then he left alone. Your wife drove home and stayed there. I did overhear their conversation, though. She was making plans to meet him again that weekend. 
I thanked him for his work, took possession of the file, and gave him a chit to ensure he got paid. I sat back and read the report in full just to get an idea of this man. The only thing I knew for sure was that I wanted revenge on him, especially since he would be responsible for taking care of my daughter. I had to leave Jamie alone. Making her my ex-wife would have to do. It was the Friday before she was due to come back, and I was jotting down some notes of things I wanted to do when the phone rang. I was so engrossed in what I was doing that I picked it up without thinking and answered with an abrupt, Yes. Hello. It's me. That's a stupid way to answer the phone. Where's Jan? I want to talk to her for a minute. I just stared at the phone in my hand. Was this the woman who called herself my wife? For the first time, I realized how she talked to me. Abrupt, dismissive, full of contempt and anger. Well, now it ends. I had no desire to string her along and play with her like a cat with a mouse. Even though I was a lawyer and we made a living manipulating people with words, I wanted none of that. I wanted to hurt her, to make her suffer, to let her feel the pain I felt as I read those letters and listened to that report. She's not here. Call back later. I slammed the phone down in anger. Screw her. Let her feel my contempt. It was only seconds before the phone rang again. I let it ring five, six times before picking it up and answering the same way. Yes. What the hell do you think you're doing hanging up on me? How dare you? Fury in her voice. Good. At least she was capable of some emotion. I slammed the phone down again, chuckling to myself. I waited, but this time the phone didn't ring again. So I went back to my lists. It was almost 10 o'clock that evening when the phone rang again. I checked the caller ID and saw that it was Jamie. I was curious to see how she would handle things this time, so I let it ring five times before answering with my usual, Yes. Jim, it's Jamie. Are you feeling better now? You seemed to be in a bad mood when I called earlier. I decided to wait for a while and hope you would be in a better place now. I wasn't in a bad mood earlier, Jamie. I just didn't want to talk to you when you were making demands. Your constant lack of respect makes me angry. That's all. What do you want? There was a short silence before she replied. I'm sorry you got that impression. I didn't mean to disrespect you. I was just in a hurry and wanted to talk to Janet. I'm sorry you thought I was making demands. Fine. What do you want, Jamie? Why are you calling? I told you Janet wasn't here. What part of that didn't you understand? Calm down. I'm not angry now that you're being respectful. What do you mean? Why am I calling? You're my husband, and I wanted to talk to you. That's all. Why wouldn't I call you when I'm away from home? Don't you miss me at all? Actually, Jamie, it's been sort of peaceful here since you've been gone. No yelling. No demands. No disrespect. Janet is happy and spending a lot of time with her friends, and I'm doing what I like without anyone criticizing me. When I go to bed, I have the whole bed to myself. It's not as if I'm missing anything from you, not for a couple of years now. So no, I don't miss you. It's been very nice with you gone. More silence. Are you still there, Jamie? Or are you done? I'm here. I guess I'm just surprised at the way you're talking to me. Have you been drinking? You sound very strange. Not a drop. Not even a beer. Just some coffee and a few crackers. Got to watch the weight, you know. Well... If I didn't know better, I'd think you're happy I'm gone. I was hoping you'd want me to hurry home, but maybe I'll just stay a while longer since you don't miss me. Would you like that, Jim? Now there was the Janie I knew and loved, soft words delivered with hints of sarcasm. She was trying to goad me into agreeing to extend her trip, but now I was going to steer this conversation my way. Well, I'll tell you what, Janie. Why don't you and good old Walter take a few extra days? just like last time. He did miss your company, didn't he? So rather than rush back to your loveless marriage, why not make him happy a bit longer? I slammed down the phone again, but this time I pulled the line from the wall. I heard the phones in the bedroom and the den start ringing, but they were too far away to be any bother. I pulled my phone from my jacket pocket 
and turned it off as well. I wanted nothing more to do with her right now, and her silence was the best part of her being gone. I was being honest when I told her it was pleasant with her away. I thought back over the conversation, and the only good thing I could take from it was her suggestion that I go out and enjoy myself. That sounded like a great idea, and one I could certainly handle. I went upstairs to change and get ready for my night out. I shaved, put on some aftershave, and looked at myself in the mirror. Not bad, really for a guy my age. I was still in good shape, working out at the club, once or twice a week while doing business. My hair was almost white, but still full and worn long, and my stomach was not too terrible, just a little bulge contained by my belt. Not bad at all. I walked back downstairs, checked the voicemail, and deleted all the messages from Jamie. I called Janet at the sleepover and let her know I would be out, but told her to call me if she needed anything. I explained my phone would be off, but I'd check for messages later. She assured me I had no need to worry about her, and said she wanted to stay until lunch the next day. I told her about her mom wanting to stay a few extra days, and she seemed pleased. I signed off with love and received hers in return. Just before I left, I took off my wedding ring, put it on a piece of string, and hung it from the mirror in our bathroom. While I didn't expect Jamie to leave her situation right away and rush back to her husband, when she did decide to come home, I wanted this to be her greeting. More importantly, I didn't want to see any reminders of her tonight while I was out. Tonight was for me. I took one last look around, remembering happier times, and then left. I drove across town to a place I hadn't visited in a few years, a bar that catered to singles and was known as the spot to meet new people. I knew the owner, having represented him once in a lawsuit against his establishment. I won, and Carmen promised me free drinks for life. Tonight, I was going to try to make a dent in that promise. I was pleased with the greeting I got when I walked in to see the place almost full. Carmen saw me, raised his hands in a victory signal, and said something to one of the women at the bar. She quickly got up, and held her stool until I arrived, bowing with a flourish to show me it was my seat before walking away. Well, well, if it ain't my main man Jimbo. How you been, Jimbo? It's good to see you. What are you drinking? How's it going, Carmen? Long time. How about you bring me a bottle of the good stuff, and just leave it here? I want to get seriously hammered, and I knew you were the only one I could trust to keep me from getting mugged afterward. You got nothing to worry about. Tell Carmen. What's the problem? She's cheating on me, Carmen. Just found out today that she's been seeing some guy in Cleveland for over a year. She and her mother made a fool out of me. Real pieces of work, those two. When in Rome, right? You talk the talk that the Romans understand, Carmen said, always blunt and to the point. He set a bottle of good scotch in front of me, poured the first glass, and placed it beside a bottle of beer. Drink up, Jimbo. Share your story. Take your time. He waved away another customer trying to get his attention, and signaled for someone else to cover the bar. I started talking, recounting everything I had discovered. Ten minutes later, I was done. Carmen just nodded as if he had known it all along. He stood up, patted my shoulder, and said, Go ahead and drink down your troubles. If you need me to do anything, just whistle. You hear? In the meantime, drink. I'll watch over you. He moved away, leaving me alone with my thoughts and the scotch. I sipped slowly but steadily, letting the burn of the alcohol dull the ache in my chest. I was well into the bottle when I became aware of someone sitting next to me. A hand brushed my thigh. Startled, I looked up to see a woman sitting close. One hand was on her drink, and the other rested on my leg. I looked at her hand, then at her face, and found her worth another glance. She was blonde, her hair a bright golden color, and her eyes were as blue as the sky. Her face was stunning, though it carried signs of maturity. I guessed she was about forty-five, maybe fifty. This wasn't a girl, it was a woman. Her face had character and intelligence. 
Hello there. Who are you? I said, my lawyer instincts making me quick with words, even if I was halfway drunk. Hello yourself. My name's Rachel English and you are. My name is Jim and you are very beautiful, Rachel. Her smile was warm and genuine and I wanted to keep it on her face. Searching my muddled brain, I added, what is a beautiful woman like you doing alone in a place like this? I can't believe you have to come here to find someone. Any man would give his right arm to be seen with you. Her smile widened, but then it faltered, replaced by a sadness that didn't ruin her beauty but made my chest ache. I wanted to make it go away. Why so sad? You shouldn't be sad. I said softly, glancing down at her hand, which still rested on my thigh. That's when I noticed the wedding ring. Your husband cheating on you. Like my wife. No, she said quietly, shaking her head. Far from it. My husband was killed in Iraq. He was a colonel, and his convoy was ambushed. He died along with most of his men. It happened two years ago. I miss him so much. She bowed her head for a moment, and when she looked back up, her eyes were clear. They say time heals all wounds, I said, my voice tinged with regret. For your sake, I hope it's true. We talked more, sharing bits and pieces of our lives. After almost two hours, we left together. I was too drunk to drive, but she wasn't. We ended up at her place, and while I'd love to say I swept her off her feet, the truth is I passed out not long after we got there. The last thing I remembered was her pulling off my shoes her touch gentle and caring. I was interested in what might happen, but apparently, the scotch had other plans. I woke the next morning in a strange bed, confused. It took me a moment to remember where I was. Then I saw Rachel standing in the doorway, holding a tray with two cups of coffee. She was wearing a thin negligee that revealed more than it covered, and I immediately lost interest in the coffee. When she set the tray down, I reached for her, and she came willingly. We shared a kiss that seemed to last forever. Her lips were soft and warm, and for the first time in years, I felt truly connected to someone. When we finally pulled apart, slightly breathless, she was smiling. Well, wasn't that something special? I feel like I'm back in high school, she said, laughing softly. Yes, it certainly was. It's good to know I'm not the only one swept away so easily. I smiled back at her, marveling at how beautiful she was. We talked some more as we sipped our coffee. Eventually, she confessed, Carmen called me last night. He's my brother. He told me to come to the bar and meet a really nice guy who was in trouble. He said you were someone worth knowing and that I might be able to help. She paused, her eyes searching mine. I'm glad I came. I didn't expect this, but I like how it feels. I reached out, taking her hand in mine. I'm glad too. I'm not sure where this will lead, but I'd like to find out. Rachel smiled, her blue eyes shining with warmth. Me too. By the time I left her house, it was past noon. Rachel drove me back to Carmen's bar to pick up my car, and we exchanged numbers. She told me to call any time, and I promised I would. As I drove home, I found myself thinking about her more than the mess with Jamie. It was a welcome change. When I got back to the house, it was quiet. Jamie wasn't there yet, and Janet was still at her friend's house. I went into the kitchen to fix myself a sandwich and noticed the answering machine light blinking. I checked the log. Ten calls, all from Jamie's cell phone. There was one more, from a number I recognized as Jamie's father's. That one caught my attention. I played it. Jim, it's Paul. When you get this, please give me a call. Jamie and her mother have gone up to the cabin for a few days at my urging. Jamie wanted to come home at once, but I talked her out of it. They both have a lot of thinking to do, as you might guess. Call me on this number. It's my cell. Take care. Interesting. I decided I'd return his call once I was ready. For now. I needed to focus on what I wanted to do next. I listened to several of the messages from Jamie next. Most were variations of her yelling about me not knowing what I was talking about, mixed with her usual condescension. 
The last two, however, were less demanding and more desperate, but none of them made any impression on me. I deleted all of them without a second thought. I checked the house to see if Janet was home, but there was no sign of her. She had mentioned she'd be back sometime in the afternoon. Feeling hungry, I made myself a sandwich and cracked open a cold beer. The food helped ease the lingering hangover, but my thoughts kept drifting back to Rachel and how different she was from Jamie. The memory of our morning together was enough to bring a small smile to my face. After I finished eating, I took the phone into the family room and called Paul back. He answered on the second ring. Hi, Paul. It's Jim. Returning your call. Jim, I'm glad you called, he said, his voice tense. I know what's going on, and that's why I reached out. I sent Jamie and her mother to the cabin to get them away from here. I'm furious with both of them, and you know part of the reason why. All I know is that Jamie's been having an affair with some guy named Walter Matthews, I said, my voice sharp. It started the last time she was there, or at least I think it did. It might have been earlier. And for your information, I believe Ruth knew about it as well. She's the one who sent his love letters to Jamie here. That's all I know, Paul. Yes, that's the bulk of it, Paul admitted. I found out by overhearing a conversation between her and her mother. Jamie told her she was going to spend the weekend with him. That's why she called you to say she was staying a couple of extra days. I was furious with Jamie when I confronted her, but all she did was cry when I yelled at her. She's been crying ever since your phone call last night. She should cry, I said, anger rising again. She's the one who destroyed our marriage. And Ruth, she's the one who encouraged her. Ruth's always hated me, but what did she have against Walter's wife and kids? Did she care that she was wrecking two families? Paul sighed heavily. Ruth's never liked anyone I've cared about, Jim. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I think she takes pleasure in creating chaos. I was furious with her, too. She kept telling Jamie that she didn't deserve you that she was smart for finding someone else. She even said you'd thank her someday. I heard the pain in Paul's voice and believed him when he said he was furious. And what did you say to Ruth about that? I asked. Paul hesitated, then admitted, I slapped her, Jim, across the face. It's the first time in our marriage I've ever hit her. It made me sick, but I couldn't stop myself. She deserved it after what she's done. Hearing that caught me off guard. While I didn't condone violence, part of me couldn't help but feel a grim satisfaction that Ruth was finally facing consequences for her actions. I'm not surprised, Paul. She bears a lot of responsibility for this mess, and she probably doesn't even see it. Paul's voice dropped lower. I'm going up to the cabin tonight to talk to them both. I don't expect it to go well. But I need to try. Do you want to talk to Jamie? I can pass the phone to her. No, I said firmly. I have nothing to say to her right now. Maybe not ever. I need time to think. Paul sighed again, but he didn't push. I understand, Jim. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Thanks, Paul. Take care of yourself. After we hung up, I sat back in the chair, thinking about what Paul had told me. It was clear that Ruth's influence had played a big part in Jamie's betrayal, but it didn't excuse Jamie's choices. She could have said no, but she didn't. That was on her. Janet came home about an hour later. Rather than waste time dancing around the issue, I told her everything I knew about her mother's affair. It wasn't done out of cruelty, but out of respect. Janet was old enough to understand what was happening and mature enough to make her own decisions, she had seen the cracks in our marriage and deserved to know the truth about why it was ending. She took the news better than I expected, though there were tears in her eyes as we talked. We spent hours discussing what this would mean for her, weighing the pros and cons of her staying with me or her mother. In the end, we both agreed it was best for her to remain here at the house with Jamie. School, meetings, and everyday activities required someone who could be present, and I couldn't do that with my work schedule. I promised her I would always ensure she was cared for and that her education wouldn't be jeopardized. 
It was nearly five o'clock when the phone rang again. Janet answered, and I heard her say, Mom, how could you? Her voice was trembling, and I hated that she had to deal with this. She talked for a few minutes, then brought the phone to me. Here, Dad. It's her. I don't want to talk to her again. There were tears in her eyes as she handed me the phone. Then she quickly left the room. I took a deep breath before speaking. Hello, Jamie. Why did you have to tell Janet? Jamie asked immediately, her tone accusatory. Why were you so cruel? Just to hurt me. Just to get back at me. Her words triggered a flood of anger. I cut her off sharply. Go to hell, Jamie. When you can talk to me decently, call. Otherwise, don't bother to call or come back here. Goodbye. I disconnected the call before she could respond. The phone rang again almost immediately. I stared at it for a moment, then picked up on the third ring. Hello, I said, my voice drained and flat. Jim, I apologize. Jamie said, her tone softer now. I was just shaken that you told Janet what I did. I don't know why you had to do that. I guess it's because you hate me now, isn't it? Actually, Jamie, not everything is about you, I said coldly. You may not believe me, but why I told her had nothing to do with you. What you did is going to affect her life as well as mine. She deserved to be treated with the respect you've denied me all this time. I told her to give her time to learn to deal with it. That's why. And as for your apology, save it. It means nothing to me anymore. There was a pause on the other end. Then Janie asked quietly, Do you hate me, Jim? No, I replied. I don't hate you. To be honest, I have no emotions when I think of you. The past two years have just about killed all the love, or any emotion, I had for you. I guess I feel some anger when I think about you and him, but I'll get over it. You've done a good job of erasing whatever I had left of us inside me. Jamie's voice cracked. Would you believe me if I told you that I'm sorry? That I wish it had never happened. I am so sorry that I let it happen. You didn't deserve this. I'm really sorry, Jim. I sighed, the weight of her words hitting me, but they didn't have the effect she probably hoped for. Like I said, Jamie, there's just a void inside me where thoughts of you used to be. Now it's empty. You asked me the other night if I missed you. The answer is becoming clearer and clearer. It's no. And you're right. You never should have allowed it to happen at all. That's what marriage vows were about, weren't they? Promises to each other. Remember saying them. Forsaking all others. You broke those vows, Jamie. And now I have to accept there's nothing left. Please tell me you don't mean that, Jim. Please tell me you don't feel that way. Jamie begged, her voice trembling. I'll be home as soon as I can. And we can work this out. I know I've done something awful, but I'll make it up to you if you just give me the chance. I don't want to make it work anymore, I said flatly. I would prefer if you just stayed away for a while longer. These last few days have been very peaceful for me. I'm doing quite well without you. Now, Janet, and I have some decisions to make about her future, and she'll decide on her own. I'm not going to influence her. She'll probably stay here with you if she can. She's only got a year and a few months left. Janie's voice cracked again. Jim, you're talking as if it's over between us. Please don't make any decisions like that until I have a chance to talk to you. I know I've messed up big time, but I can make it up to you if you'll only give me a chance. Jim, I realize now that I love you more than I ever realized. I forgot for a while, but now I remember why I loved you. I do, and I don't want to lose you. Please wait for me, Jim. Wait until I get home. I sighed deeply, my patience thinning. I have no interest in your love for me, Jamie. Your love means nothing to me anymore. I would rather stay away from it for the rest of my life. As for me, this marriage is over. And like I said, don't bother coming home right away. I hung up quickly, my hand trembling as I placed the phone back on its receiver. Tears stunned my eyes as I heard her voice breaking on the other end. But I couldn't let myself feel sympathy. Not now. 
What was left of the love I once had for Jamie was fading fast, but the pain of her betrayal still sat heavy on my chest. The phone began to ring almost as soon as I hung up. I glanced at the caller ID. It was Jamie again. I ignored it. I was done talking to her. Each time the phone rang after that, I ignored it. It wasn't until almost noon on the following Wednesday that my secretary buzzed me at work to let me know I had a call. It's your wife, she said hesitantly. It's been forwarded from Margaret Wilson's line. I frowned, annoyed. I had told my secretary days ago not to accept calls from Jamie. Why did you take it? I asked sharply. Margaret insisted, she said apologetically. I didn't know what to say. Margaret. Hell, I had forgotten that Jamie and Margaret were friends. Margaret was a real piece of work, sharp, cold, and manipulative. She'd been divorced four times and was no role model for anyone's marriage. But she and Jamie had hit it off years ago, and I always wondered why. Now I began to see the similarities between them. Fine, I muttered, irritated. I'll take it. Not your fault, Susie. I pressed the button for the line. Yes, what is it? And this had better be good, Margaret. I'm not going to forget this little betrayal. Margaret's tone was smug. Oh, Jim, I had no idea there were problems between you two. But what the hell are you doing? You won't even talk to your wife. She's on now. I'm hanging up. Talk to her. And with that, Margaret disconnected, leaving me no choice but to hear Jamie's voice. Hello, Jamie. What can I do for you? I asked, my tone devoid of warmth. You can come home and talk to me, she said, her voice tired and strained. I'm at home, Jim, so please, can we talk? Whose home is that, Jamie? I snapped. Walter Matthews' home. Certainly not ours. You destroyed that one, didn't you? I heard a muffled sob on the other end. Jamie seemed to be trying a different tactic now. Pleading. Jim, please come home and talk to me. I owe you an explanation, and I promise to give it to you. No lies, no excuses. Please, Jim, just come home. What do you really want, Jamie? Just to be taken care of while you do whatever you please behind my back. Isn't that what you've been doing for the past two years? You treat me like dirt, refuse to communicate, make my life a living hell. And then you went to him. You said you were visiting your mother, but you went to him instead. You made plans to spend the weekend with him again, just like last time, and you were going to insult me until I agreed that you should stay longer. You were trying to use me to justify your choices. Was it that much better with him? I wasn't holding back anymore. The anger that had simmered for days was bubbling over. My voice was cold and sharp, and I didn't care how much it hurt her. Please, Jim, she said softly, barely above a whisper. I guess I deserve that. But you're wrong about Walter and me. I didn't even see him this trip. Honest. I let out a bitter laugh. Didn't even see him. You spent the whole weekend with him at the Dorchester Hotel. What about Wednesday? Doesn't dinner on Wednesday night count? You made plans to spend the weekend with him again, Jamie. You were sitting close together, touching. God knows what else under the table, or do you just not count those moments as seeing him? Jim, she stammered, her voice breaking. I, I just met him briefly to tell him it was over. I swear, that's all it was. I didn't go anywhere else with him. That was the only time I saw him. More lies, Jamie. I know what you did. And what about the last trip? Didn't you have a little encounter in the parking lot? Do you deny that? Silence filled the line. The truth was crashing down on her now, and she had no way to explain it away. Finally, I heard her whisper, No, I don't deny it. Good, I said coldly. At least you're finally admitting to something. Let's not forget about your mother's involvement in all of this either. She encouraged you, didn't she? She introduced you to him. She even sent his love letters to you. Tell me, Jamie. Did you two laugh together about how you were pulling the wool over my eyes? Did you tell her how much better he was than me? Her response was not what I expected. A scream erupted from her, raw and full of pain, 
followed by the sharp click of her hanging up. I sat there for a moment, breathing heavily, my chest heaving with the effort to contain my emotions. My anger was white-hot, but beneath it was a deep, gnawing sadness that refused to leave. I hung up the phone, staring blankly at the wall, exhausted and drained. I had two choices. I could go home and let Jamie try to justify her actions, or I could begin making plans to end this sham of a marriage. The pain and anger burning inside me pushed me toward the latter. I picked up my office phone and called in two of my associates, one specializing in divorce law. When they arrived, I briefed them on my situation. As we talked, I found it easier than I had expected to separate my emotions from the case. After all, that's what this was now. A case. Something I'd handled countless times for clients. My name happened to be on the papers, but that was the only thing different. My associates quickly forgot that this was their boss's wife and got to work. The first thing I requested was for them to prepare to file a suit in Ohio for alienation of affections against Walter Matthews. It was an unusual legal move, but still legitimate. I probably wouldn't win, but I didn't care. I wasn't interested in money. I wanted him to face public accountability for his actions. I wanted his wife and kids to know what kind of man he was. She deserved to know, and then she could decide what to do with him. I handed over the stack of love letters to one of the associates. Prepare a motion to have these analyzed for handwriting confirmation, I instructed. They're damning enough on their own, but we'll need proof they came from him. The associate smiled grimly as he read through one of the letters before tucking the entire stack into his briefcase. He would be flying to Cleveland tomorrow to file the paperwork and get the process started. Meanwhile, the other associate and I outlined a strategy for my personal financial matters. We discussed closing certain accounts, transferring funds, and conducting an outside audit of my holdings. This was to ensure that my assets were secure before an audit could take place during the divorce proceedings. I wasn't about to let Jamie walk away with more than she deserved. By the end of the day, the plans were in motion, and I finally felt like I was back in control of my life. When I left the office, I headed home to prepare for the inevitable confrontation. Walking into the house, I found Jamie sitting on the couch with Janet in the family room. Janet's eyes were red from crying, and Jamie looked equally distraught. They both turned to look at me as I entered. Janet jumped up, ran to me, and wrapped her arms around me tightly. Good luck, Dad, she whispered. Whatever happens, I love you. I kissed her on the forehead and watched her walk away, her head held high despite the pain I knew she was feeling. Janet was strong, far stronger than her mother, and that thought gave me some peace. I sighed and turned back to Jamie, who hadn't moved from her spot on the couch. Well, Jamie, I began, sitting down in the chair across from her. You wanted to talk to me. Tell me, why did you betray me? Why did you ruin everything we had? Why did you betray Janet and me? Jamie looked down at her hands, which were trembling in her lap. I don't know, she whispered. I know that's not an answer, but it's the truth. I just don't know why I did it. I leaned back in the chair, watching her carefully. She didn't look up as she continued, her voice shaking. The first time I went home, I just needed to get away. I had no intention of doing anything like this. I didn't even think about it. For the first week, all I did was spend time with my parents. Then Mom introduced me to Walter. She said he was a friend of hers from church and that he was in a bad marriage. She asked if I would talk to him. She paused, taking the shaky breath. We went to dinner that Friday the night before I was supposed to fly home. He was very charming and complimented me a lot. He would touch my hand when he spoke and even pushed a strand of hair off my face. He was so smooth and I was swept away. By the end of the evening, I was attracted to him in ways I hadn't felt in a long time. Not even with you. I know now it was wrong. But in that moment, I wanted him. I wanted him so badly. Jamie finally looked up, tears streaming down her face. You know we hadn't been intimate for months before I left, Jim. I thought my drive was gone. But that night, it came back. He saw it 
and he took me to a motel. We spent the night together. I felt my anger rising, white-hot and consuming. My fists clenched so tightly that my knuckles turned white. I remained seated, though every fiber of my being wanted to lash out. I couldn't give her the satisfaction of seeing me lose control. Jamie continued, oblivious to the storm brewing inside me. The next day, I called you and told you I was staying a couple of extra days. I spent them with Walter at that motel. When I came home, I never called him or wrote to him. I tried to forget what I'd done. I was so ashamed. I didn't come to you for intimacy because I thought you'd somehow know. I couldn't risk it. She broke down completely, sobbing into her hands. I'm so sorry, Jim. I love you. I never stopped loving you. And I'm so ashamed of what I did. I think I might just die from the shame. I stood, staring down at her. Well, that's quite a story, Jamie, I said icily. But why don't I believe a word of it? Jamie's sobbing quieted as she looked up at me, her face pale and tear-streaked. Why don't you believe me? She asked, her voice trembling. Why? I repeated, my tone sharp and cutting. First, because you shut me out long before you left for your mother's house. You were already treating me like garbage back then. Second, because I know some of the things you did with him, Jamie, things you refused to do with me. Why is that, do you suppose? Why would you give to him what you denied me, your husband? Jamie flinched as if I'd slapped her, but I wasn't done. You planned to do it again, didn't you? This trip wasn't just about seeing your mother. You met him the first weekend you were there. You spent time with him. And on Wednesday night, you made plans to spend the weekend with him again. Don't deny it, Jamie. I know the truth. I was breathing hard now, my chest heaving with the force of my anger. My hands were balled into fists, and I could feel my nails digging into my palms. I knew she could see the fury in my eyes. But I didn't care. This needed to be said. You denied me your body and your heart for almost two years, Jamie. You denied me your love and affection for even longer. And to make it worse, you gave it all to someone else. You gave him parts of yourself you said were too much to try with me. You betrayed me not just with infidelity, but with your complete disregard for our marriage and for me. Jamie opened her mouth to speak, but I held up a hand to stop her. And then there's your mother, I continued. She was a part of this, wasn't she? She's hated me from the start, but what I don't understand is what she had against his wife and kids. Did she even think about what she was doing to their family? Did you? Jamie shook her head, tears streaming down her face again. No, Jim, I didn't. It was too easy for you, Jamie, I interrupted, my voice rising. It was too easy for you to betray me and our marriage. It shouldn't have been so easy. That's why I know it's over. That's why I know you don't love me. You recognized it first. You just didn't have the courage to admit it. Jamie shot to her feet, crossing the space between us in a rush. She reached for me, but I slapped her hands away and stepped back. Stay away from me, I growled. I want nothing to do with you. Don't touch me. Jim, please. Jamie begged, her voice cracking. You can't mean that. I love you, and I won't give you up. I took another step back, my gaze cold and unwavering. I will walk away from you if you try to touch me again. And let me make one thing clear. Giving up on this marriage is no longer your choice. You threw that away when you went to that motel with Walter Matthews. You slammed the door shut when you stayed with him that weekend. There is no longer any love in my heart for you, Jamie. You killed all of it with your betrayal. Jamie collapsed to the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. Her hands cradled her head, as if she were trying to shield herself from my words, but they hit their mark. She was still Jamie Parker, but she would never again be Jamie Schwann, wife of Jim Schwann. That role was over, and I had already begun the process of reclaiming my life. I turned on my heel and walked upstairs. I needed space, needed to get away from her cries echoing in the house. I moved my things into the spare room, tossing essentials into a duffel bag. As I stood in the bathroom gathering toiletries, I caught sight of my wedding ring, 
still hanging on the piece of string from the mirror. I stared at it for a long moment before turning away. It could stay there. It was nothing more than a symbol of something that no longer existed. For the next few days, Jamie and I avoided each other. She tried to talk to me a few times, but I refused to engage. I kept my distance, spending most of my time working on legal matters or talking with Janet. My daughter had shown incredible strength and maturity throughout this ordeal, and I was proud of her. One evening, while I was in the den reviewing some paperwork, the phone rang. I reached for it instinctively, but I stopped short when I heard Jamie's voice. She must have picked up the extension at the same time. To my surprise, the caller was Walter Matthews. Jamie, it's me, Walter, he said, his tone urgent. Jamie's voice was low, but I could hear the anger simmering beneath it. Walter, I told you never to call me here. And I told you I never wanted to see you or talk to you again. So, why are you calling? Did you know your husband has filed suit against me in court? Walter asked, his voice rising. He filed it in Cleveland. I was served at home, in front of my wife and kids. He's suing me for alienation of affections. For one million dollars. Janie let out a bitter laugh. Oh my God. I knew he found out, but I didn't know he'd go this far. Well, guess you'll have to tell your wife now, won't you? Guess your broken marriage is really going to be broken up now, you deceitful bastard. After the lies you told me about your broken marriage, your hated wife, your pending divorce, you deserve this. So go to hell, Walter. She slammed the phone down, cutting him off mid-shout. I sat in the den, stunned, listening as Jamie stormed past the room. She didn't even glance in my direction. I waited a moment, then quietly hung up my phone. It seemed Walter had underestimated me, and Jamie had finally seen through him. But her realization came too late. The damage was done, and our marriage was beyond repair. A few hours later, Jamie came into the den, her face pale and her expression hollow. She stood in the doorway, staring at me for a long moment before speaking. You had this all planned out, didn't you? She said, her voice barely above a whisper. You were just waiting until you had everything in place before confronting me. I set my paperwork aside and leaned back in my chair, fixing her with a steady gaze. That's right, Jamie. I've been married to you for almost twenty years, and somehow I forgot my own motto. Give them maximum pain, and make it hurt for a long time. But I remembered it when I found those letters. Now, I'm just following through. She flinched but didn't look away. I guess you're going for the maximum with Walter. How about me? What do you have planned for me? Her tone was tinged with bitterness, but it lacked her usual fire. For you? Nothing. I said calmly, Walter is the one who destroyed another man's marriage, even while he had a wife and five kids of his own. He's going to pay as much as I can make him. As for you, well, I'm done. I've already started the divorce process. You'll get what's fair, but that's it. And I've offered to help his wife, Margaret, with her own divorce if she chooses to go that way. Maybe, if you play your cards right, you can marry him when she kicks him out. Jamie shook her head, tears filling her eyes. You know better than that, Jim. I don't love him. I don't even like him right now. He lied to me about everything. He and my mother. I hate them both for what they've done to me. To us. I raised an eyebrow, unmoved. What they've done to you. You mean what you allowed them to do, don't you? Don't pretend you're a victim, Jamie. You made your choices. You followed their lead willingly. Her voice cracked as she pleaded. Can't you forgive me? Let me make it up to you. I'll never do anything like this again. You know that. Please, Jim, let me try. I shook my head slowly. Sorry, Jamie. You had your chance, and you made your choice. Like I said, it was far too easy for you to walk away from me. Too easy by far. That tells me everything I need to know. I stood, brushing past her as I turned off the desk lamp and prepared to leave the room. She took in my polished shoes and suit and realized I was dressed to go out. Her voice wavered as she asked, Where are you going? Don't wait up for me. 
I replied evenly. I have a date tonight, and I probably won't be back until morning. Jamie's face crumpled as tears spilled down her cheeks. I didn't wait for her response. I walked out the door, leaving her standing in the den, sobbing quietly. That night, I met Rachel again. She greeted me with a warm smile, her sapphire blue eyes lighting up when I walked into the restaurant. We talked for hours over dinner, sharing stories about our lives and hopes for the future. When the evening mooned down, she invited me back to her house. I had brought an overnight bag at her suggestion, and I wasn't disappointed. That night, for the first time in years, I felt wanted, respected, and cared for. Rachel had a way of making me feel alive again, and I knew I wanted her to be a part of my life moving forward. The following week, things began to move quickly. My lawsuit against Walter Matthews was filed, and he was served with the papers in front of his family. As expected, the news of the suit caused immediate fallout in his household. His wife, Mary, contacted my office, and I arranged a meeting with her. She was devastated but determined to protect her children. I offered her the assistance of one of my associates, who was more than willing to help her pursue a divorce and custody of their five kids. Jamie, meanwhile, seemed to deteriorate emotionally. She stayed in the house, keeping to herself most of the time, and avoided both Janet and me. Janet, for her part, made it clear that she had no interest in repairing her relationship with her mother. She had seen enough to know where her loyalties lay, and she chose to stay with me after the divorce. I made sure she knew I supported her no matter what, and I promised to make the transition as smooth as possible for her. Three weeks later, Janie left the house and moved in with her mother. By then, my lawyers had finalized the terms of the divorce agreement. Jamie would receive a fair settlement, but I retained custody of Janet and ownership of the house. The process took less than a year to finalize, thanks to the efficiency of my legal team. Janet stayed with me, and her relationship with Jamie remained distant, though I encouraged her to keep the door open if she ever felt ready. As for Walter Matthews, his life fell apart swiftly. His wife's divorce lawyer, provided by my firm, made sure she received the house, primary custody of the kids, and significant alimony and child support. Walter's finances were devastated, and his reputation in the community took a major hit. The alienation of affection suit, though unlikely to succeed in court, still forced him to answer publicly for his actions, and that was enough for me. Two years later, my life looked completely different. Janet had graduated high school and was preparing to leave for college, and I was preparing to marry Rachel. She had become a source of strength and joy in my life, and she and Janet had formed a close bond. Together, the three of us had found a sense of peace and happiness that had been missing for far too long. Jamie, on the other hand, wasn't faring as well. She had aged visibly over the last couple of years and was struggling with her health. She still lived with her mother, Ruth, though their relationship had soured. Ruth blamed Jamie for everything that had happened, refusing to acknowledge her own role in the mess. According to Janet, Ruth spent most of her time bitter and alone in a community retirement home, stewing over her perceived injustices. In the end, I realized that I had won, not through revenge, but by taking control of my life and finding happiness again. The pain Jamie had caused me had been profound, but it no longer defined me. I was free to live, love, and build a future with someone who truly valued me. Rachel and I were ready to start the next chapter of our lives, and for the first time in years, I felt whole again. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.